Great. Um, Pat, you said you're going to record and it's good. All right. Well, thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, Pat didn't mention, but I've been working with him for a number of years on various projects. Um, and today I will be presenting the preliminary results for my um, second thesis objective, um, talking about the genome rearrangements that I've looked at um, facilitated by these truncated um, retrotransposons found in the interior of the genome. So to give you a little bit of background information, um, the organism that I work with is a highly pathogenic fungus. Um, it specifically infects a number of grass species, over 50 different species of grasses, and is found across the globe in about 85 different countries. Um, and the species that infects range from um, grasses that are major agricultural crops to us, such as rice and wheat, um, and a number of other cereal grasses like um, oats and barley and finger millet. Um, we've seen more recently um, outbreaks of the wheat blast strain. Um, it first arose in the 1980s in Brazil and swept through South America. Um, we've also seen wheat blast in the US and um, more notably in 2016, it caused um, major devastation to crop fields in Bangladesh, um, where in some fields we saw 100% yield loss in wheat. Um, contrastly, we also see um, specifically more so in the US, um, infections of the um, blast fungus, Magnaporthiorhizae and turf grasses on golf courses. And part of the success of this pathogen um, is because for a number of reasons, like any good pathogenic strain, it's or not pathogenic strain, I'm sorry, any good pathogen, um, it's able to mutate and evolve rapidly. Um, part of that is because it has a haploid genome or part of that success comes from it having a haploid genome, um, meaning that it only has one copy of each of its chromosomes. Um, so whenever you have a mutation or a rearrangement that arises, um, that is what is essentially, ex essentially expressed or allowed to be expressed. Um, whereas if you had a diploid genome, the other chromosome then might be expressed instead. Um, and we know that within this fungus, it experiences frequent um, structural rearrangements, specifically within the telomere. Um, we also know that these genomes are littered with transposable elements. Um, and we see these more towards um, the telomeric regions of the genome as well. Um, notably, um, about 50% of effector genes map near telomeres. Um, effector genes are those that are involved in infection. Um, and actually, I should say 50% of avirulence genes. Um, and avirulence genes are essentially um, markers that can serve as flags to the host plant that is being infected with that fungus. Um, so it's beneficial to the fungus then to have these frequent mutations um, that arise. Um, so it's therefore unrecognizable. And we also see in some strains that we've had avirulence genes that are completely lost um, that helps with um, host specificity as well. Um, so here I have subtelomere avirulence gene AVR PITA. Um, the loss or mutation of this um, gene itself has allowed it to infect um, rice strains or rice cultivars that have the complementary um, PITA gene. Um, and I mentioned telomeres earlier, just to give you um, a recap or, or kind of a background on what those are for those of you who aren't familiar. Um, telomeres are found at the ends of chromosomes and are comprised of these short repeat sequences. Um, that are bound by shelter and protein complexes, and they essentially prevent chromosome ends from degradation and loss, um, or so we thought, and we'll talk about that a little more in the next presentation. Um, Magnaporthiorhizae telomeres are especially interesting because we know that among the various strains, um, we see a high degree of variability in that subtelomeric region. And even more interesting, we found that within the progeny of a single parent in some strains, that there is also a lot of um, variability and rearrangements that we see occur in this region. And it was found that this variability is due to the presence of motor elements within telomeric regions or within the telomere. 
Um, MOTOR itself, itself stands for Magna Porthia Rhizae Telomere Retrotransposon. Um, a retrotransposon is a type of transposable element or mobile genetic element um, that can move around the genome and insert itself within sequences using a RNA transcript. Um, here we have MOTOR1, which codes a reverse transcriptase is, and is about five kilobases long. And we also have motor two, which is about 1.7 kilobases long and does not encode a reverse transcriptase, but shares um, syntony in the three prime and five prime regions uh, with motor one. Um, within the telomere or within the genome, motors typically exist like so, um, where you can have them in an array. They exist in the opposite direction. So this is the three prime end of the chromosome and the motors are sort of flipped where their five prime end is, is facing the opposite direction. Um, here we have truncated and full motors. I will note that in other telomeres, we might have one motor um, or we'll have telomeres that don't have any motors inserted. Um, but typically when you have an array like this, they're separated by these interstitial telomere repeats, which are noted with these yellow circles here. And depending on the number of these repeats between motor elements, this causes instability and breakage within telomeres. And we think that motors are endemic to the telomere, but we've actually found um, cases of truncated motors within the interior of the genome. Um, and these we call motor relics. Um, these we think are note breakage and repair events that have shifted them out of the telomere into the interior of the genome. And you can see some variation here with some that are truncated both in the three prime and five prime regions, just the three prime or just the five prime. Um, my work specifically looks at those motor relics that have this maintained three prime region as well as a telomere repeat that denote their origin in the telomere. The objective um, of my study or for this <clears throat> current objective was to profile the motor relics of host specific strains and full genome assemblies and to investigate how motor relics come to reside in the interior of the genome. Um, I looked at 10 different strains um, from various lineages um, from this single species. We have the lolium um, lineage, which is for rye grasses, triticum for wheat, eleusine for goose grasses, sonotiferum for St. Augustine, Ariza for um, rice, rachiaria for signal grass, and sataria for um, foxtail or bristle grasses. And for this, for my methods, I first had to define um, my parameters for what exactly a motor relic, what I would consider a motor relic to be. Um, so first I decided obviously it had to be located in the interior of the genome um, and could not be part of a motor array in the telomere. Um, it had to have that maintained three prime end sequence, which you can see noted below here. And it also had to have a telomere repeat. I then did a series of um, local blasts where first I blasted full motor one and motor two sequences against the genome. Um, I used the task short nucleotide blast with an E value of one E negative one. Um, I also used um, the Unix command grep um, to search for exact matches of the three prime end sequence and transformed these into FASTA files. And then to determine whether these matches were true relics and not just aberrant matches in the genome, um, I then blasted those FASTA files against um, motor sequences. And then once I found what my true relics were, I then blasted those against the genome to find their position. So for my first um, bit of results, I first looked at the variation in motor relic distribution and abundance among the various strains. And I'm just going to show a few examples here. Um, these were some strains where there was a very low abundance of motor relics. Here on the left, we can see BM, BM88324, which is from Brachiaria, um, had only seven relics. And U233 um, had the least amount of relics in all of the strains, where it only had one showing up. 
Um, contrastly, we saw in some strains that they were littered with motor relics. Um, these strains saw had 14 relics within them. Um, FH belongs to lolium and CD156 belongs to leucine. And when I looked at some of these, I noticed so these certain populations or motifs that seem to be repeated in some of the strains that made me think that these relics must um, be the same. So notice on chromosome three, chromosome six and chromosome seven especially. So then um, what I did to investigate which strains actually shared the same relics and which relics were unique. Um, I did a series of, of more local nucleotide blasts of each of the genomes against each other. Um, I then filtered to the chromosomes of interest where those relics were located and expanded upon those regions by about 50 to 100 kilobases um, to ensure that these regions were actually the same. And I found some interesting results. Um, in chromosome two, um, if we look at the left side, I have um, all of chromosome two from the just eight of the strains that I looked at. Um, the color of the relic um, denotes which ones are matching. Those that are white are relics that were unique and had no match in other strains. And um, those that are the same color are shared. Um, so interestingly, if we focus on the blue relic um, shared by LPKY, G11, and BM88324, um, this one I thought was incredibly surprising because if I were to go back to that phylogeny we looked at, um, LPKY and G11 are very distantly related to each other. Um, so I would expect to see this blue relic um, showing up in other strains as well, such as FH, CD156 and B71, which are very more uh, closely related to LPKY. Um, contrastly, some other chromosomes like chromosome four seem to have no relics at all, or if there were relics, they weren't shared in other strains. And then I mentioned previously um, when I was looking at some of the chromosomes that there were these populations of relics that looked to be the same. Um, and that was verified by looking at blast searches um, where we see this, this middle population of relics is all shared in chromosome three. And it's likely that this um, first showed up in the Eleusine lineage, which is the one that CD156 belongs to and um, moved into the other lineages or, or is ancestral to them. And we think that this could suggest this population of fear of relics in the middle could suggest that maybe a telomere or chromosomal fusion event occurred. Um, for the other parts of this objective, um, we know that previously a lot of these relics are associated with um, duplicate sequences found flanking them. Um, we have various kinds. Um, a shows a three prime end duplication uh, be a whole locus duplication where the relic and both of its flanking sequences are duplicated. Um, C is a five prime flanking sequence duplication and D is a relic and five prime flanking sequence duplication. Um, and these are thought to maybe highlight how the relics were actually formed through various breakage repair mechanisms in the chromosome. Um, so I wanted to look at my different strains and survey the, rel the excuse me, the duplications found around them to sort of clear that up a bit. Um, so to do this, I did, you guessed it, even more uh, nucleotide blasts where I blasted the genome against itself um, using an E value of one E negative 20. And this, for this, I did not use the task um, short blast. <clears throat> I also blasted motors against the genome as well as other transposable elements that we know of to date. Um, and then I used IGV Integrative Genomics Viewer to look at these sequences and see how they were associated. Um, so here we can see motor one within chromosome three of FH. And to the right, there are these various um, sequences duplicated there. Um, for my duplicate, duplicate sequences, the ones that I decided to include um, had to be within 20 to 30 base pairs of the motor relic. And also, um, we do see a lot of transposable elements within these genomes. Um, so if a duplication was entirely made up of a transposable element, I did not um, consider it. 
uh, so those are seen all over the genome anyways. Um, however, if the duplication contained a transposable element and had unique sequence flanking um, the element itself, I then included it. Um, after that, I plotted all of my data in R using the Circos package. And these are just two examples of the plots that I made. Um, around the outside, we have the seven core chromosomes here. Um, on the inside, you can see the triangles denoting the motor relics again. Um, those that are in white are ones that have no duplication. Um, those in green shown here in CD156 had a three prime flanking duplication and um, those in gray had a relic and five prime flanking duplication. And some of these had a combination of both. So notice this doesn't add up to 100%. Um, for the links here, <clears throat> excuse me, the color corresponds to um, the chromosome in which I found that relic. Um, so here we have in chromosome three, a relic with a three prime flanking duplication and that duplicate sequence is also found in chromosome five. Now to actually talk about the results in front of us, um, the vast majority of my strains had a lot of duplications associated with relics. So I was incredibly surprised to see of the seven relics in BM88324 that there were no duplicate sequences associated with it. Um, and then in CD156, I chose this because this one highlights um, patterns that I saw and the other strains where all of the duplications are associated either with um, the ends of chromosomes within about 500 kilobases of the end or other motor relics. Um, there is an exception that you can see here in chromosome one um, where we have a duplicate sequence that's about 1.6 megabases in. Um, this duplicate sequence is flanked by another um, transposable element. So I think it's possible it could be associated with that instead. Um, but it also is interesting to note that we found within, I think it's about 1.8 kilobases in. So about 200 K, uh, not 1.8 megabases, excuse me. So about 200 kilobases away, we know there are several um, other telomeric sequences that map to this region. So this could be sort of a hot spot um, or a bed for telomeric sequences. So for my results so far, um, suggests that we have a lot of historical telomere rearrangements um, that have moved these relics to the interior of the genome um, that showcase frequent telomere breakage and repair. Um, most of the rearrangements that I saw with relics were occurring near telomere ends. And interestingly, um, like we saw earlier in chromosome three, um, they may have highlighted a chromosomal fusion event. And obviously we need more evidence to, to support that. Um, also, I saw that motor relics were variable even among closely related strains, um, but in some cases they were highly conserved. And I think that it's possible um, that other retrotransposons may be shuffling um, relics around the genome, and they could be providing um, templates um, such as telomeric sequence for motor relics to translocate to. And then lastly, um, it was proposed by um, Rahanama et al. Um, last year that these duplicate sequences, when they looked at this in LPKY, um, could potentially contain genes um, and could be allowing this fungus to shuffle genes around the genome um, to and from subtelomeric regions and mini chromosomes. And that leads me into my future work um, where I want to, if I have time, um, survey motor relic loci and duplicate sequences for gene content. And then also for my other objective of my thesis, I will be analyzing Illumina sequences um, of about 160 strains for motor relics. And from that, I want to construct um, an unrooted phylogeny and see if that tracks the true phylogeny of these strains in this single species. These are my references. And um, I want to quickly thank um, Dr. Pat Calley for all of his help and support. Um, my committee members, Boggs in the graduate cohort, especially my co-advisor, Dr. Ranama, um, and then also the principal investigator of this study, Dr. Mark Farman. 
And um, thank you for your attention and time. I now want to turn your focus to another aspect of our team's research efforts. Um, Haley Bruss and Murray Baker uh, began working with us last year as sophomores investigating the phenomenon of the roles of telomeres and maintaining magnaporthic chromosome end integrity. Um, they have utilized two different sets of genetic elements using sophisticated bioinformatic approaches to examine this phenomenon. Um, I'll now turn over the discussion over to Murray and Haley and we'll leave questions for the end. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I hope everyone's doing great. And uh, my name's Haley Bruss. And my name's Murray Baker. And we wanted to take this time to discuss with you all the research we've been working on a little over a year now in regard to the fungus Magnaportha and its prevalence in chromosomal sequence integrity by telomeres. Oh. Okay, so some background information that's relevant to this presentation would be the knowledge of what a telomere is, a telomere junction and a telomere adjacent sequence. So essentially a telomere is a repeated hexamere found at the end of a linear chromosome and its job is essentially to protect the genomic sequence within the chromosome. A telomere junction is a region in between the telomere and the genomic sequence itself. It serves as a boundary in between the two and then a genomic or a telomere adjacent sequence is a small region right past the telomere that um, essentially serves as where the genomic sequence starts, and it is made up of short subtelomeric specific tandem repeat motifs. So our study focused on analyzing Magnaportha arisei and Magnaportha grisea, and more specifically, Magnaportha arisei is one of the most widely distributed agents of rice blast disease, which is a highly destructive disease in crops, and ultimately it can lead to up to 50% of crop loss. And telomeres are of special interest in the blast fungus Magnaportha because the adjacent regions are enriched in genes controlling interactions with host plants. And not only this, but the chromosome ends show enhanced polymorphism and genetic instability. And this phenomenon makes certain strains capable of host jumping, meaning that the pathogen can start in a host such as Woleum and then go to a, another host such as Triticum. And this is a major challenge in plant pathology and agriculture. And in our study, we examined over 200 fungal strains that came from over 11 grass hosts, which spanned five years. So our objectives in this investigation was to essentially determine if telomeres did their jobs and preserved the ends of the chromosomes. Our second objective was to determine if the telomere junction sequences were the same in each strand or if they were just randomly generated. And our last objective was to determine if the telomere adjacent sequences were able to translate or translocate from the ends of the chromosomes to somewhere within the interior region. Um, a previous analysis of Magnaportha revealed that the sequences immediately adjacent to the telomeres of one strain were frequently absent from other strains of the fungus, and if they were present, they were not located at the telomeres. So we hypothesized that conserved telomere junction sequences are not conserved among all fungal strains. And our analysis will ultimately reveal if this is the prior observations were a sampling size limitation or ultimately a true biological <laughs> So in the beginning, we started looking at telomere junction sequences to determine if the conservation among different strains was relevant. We started by sequencing over 200 fungal strains and we determined that 145 of them were good for further analysis. This was done by Dr. Farman's lab up at UK. And then this data provided the basis for further investigation. We then examined the Illumina sequence reads or the 2020 Cicathello outputs which was given by the sequencing of the fungal strains that we used uh, manual interrogation methods to identify the telomere mini contigs and the telomere junctions using a custom program called Cicathello, which was provided by Jen Ziglu and her colleagues also at UK. And then once all the junctions and the binary translations were identified, we began a pattern of analysis using Unix and command line operations and the language bash and then by the end of everything, we had manually interrogated 1,148 tungal telomere junctions and retained 819 of them for further analysis. Okay, so at the top of this slide depicts the manual interrogation phase, which is an example of the Illumina sequence reads or the 2020 Cicothella outputs. 
on the left hand side of this example shows the telomeric sequence and the genomic sequence, while the right hand side of this indicates the binary translation. The red box shows where the telomere junction was located and this can be identified by the telomere repeat stopping and the genomic sequence begins. The binary translation is made up of pluses and dots. Pluses indicate that the examined strain match the primary strain and the dots indicate that there is no match at all between the two. And then to increase effectiveness of a pattern analysis, we used a virtual machine to, to utilize a bash command line script, which essentially made it possible to transpose and manipulate the data swiftly and give us an output from the VM, which we then copied into a master sheet. The master sheet was a sheet that contained all strains and sequences that were analyzed and showed what strains correlated with the dots and what strains correlated with the pluses. We were then able to use Unix command line to double check or to ensure that the identified junction sequences were accurate as seen on the right hand screen. So in this figure is our is the result for our telomere junctions, which was generated by Dr. Mostafa using our master sheet. On the y-axis is the number of strains of each consensus that had a match, while the x-axis is the number of populations examined and the number of strains in each population. Then the number of, and then the numbers at the top of the graph is the numbers, is the number of matches that each population had. The blue dots identify strains that have one match to a single strain, while red dots indicate strains that have multiple matches against other populations and other strains. This box plot shows poor conservation of telomere junction regions because not all strains in each population have the same telomere junction sequence, which can be, in, which can be indicated by the high number of red dots. And then this can, this can be seen in the population O or Orise due to the high number of blue dots and the low number of red dots. So if telomeres were if telomeres were doing their jobs in preserving the telomere junction regions, we would only see red dots, which indicates that each strain has its own specific telomere junction sequence. However, we see a high number of blue dots in many of the populations examined, showing that the telomere junctions are not the same for each strain. Sorry, quick interjection. Can uh... Can you guys please not move your laptop? It interferes with the mic and it blasts us kind of hard. Yeah. Sorry about that. Continue. I don't know if that happens again. Sorry about that. Um, so with telomere junctions showing poor conservation among strains, we question if this result would hold true for the sequences found immediately adjacent to the telomeres. And um, blast searches were used to examine the distribution of telomere adjacent sequences from the tel contigs data set. And like my colleague Jane had mentioned, BLAST is a Google search engine used to interrogate nucleotide sequences. And for our study, BLAST was used to analyze over 200 Magnaportha genomes, which infected over 17 host plant genera. And telomere repeats were stripped off the start of the tel consensus sequences, which were then used as queries in our BLAST searches of the genome assemblies. And we filtered through our BLAST output, discarding and resampling any sequences containing polymers of ends which were indicative of gaps or repeats. And the term hit was used if there was a sequence match between the subject and the query of our BLAST searches, and valid hits were scored as alignments that covered at least 90% of the query. And from this BLAST output, we were able to further analyze our data using binary stats and um, really analyzing the frequency and distribution of these adjacent sequences to find out things such as lineage specificity. And so on this slide, the first picture up at the top is going to show you a command I created using bash language to spit out the blast report, which is seen right below it. And a blast report looks pretty daunting at first, but once you, once you understand what's going on, you can really see how beneficial they can be to your research. So the first column is going to be your query sequence IDs, and your second column is your subject sequence IDs. And then columns three through nine, you can manipulate to your specific needs. So since we were looking for only um, valid hits that were 90% of the query alignment, I included things like alignment length and then start and ends of the query and subject sequences. And then the image on the right depicts how you can manipulate a BLAST report. So since we were looking for those valid hits, I made files of all of the 200 subjects 
in their respective query consensuses or consensi, sorry. And um, from this BLAST report, so the files look like this. And on the left column, it's going to show you your number of hits. And then on the right column, it's going to be your query consensus for that specific subject. So for example, IB49 consensus 15 had one hit, whereas down at the bottom, Arcadia consensus eight had two hits. And I compiled these files into a master sheet that looked like this. One second. And um, this master sheet gave us convenience and allowed us to do further analysis, such as the lineage specificity that I mentioned earlier. And um, this is just a screen capture. This is a pretty small portion of the master sheet that was generated. But basically, this column right here is going to be your query strain IDs. And then to the left, it's their respective populations. And then to the right, it's their consensus number. And then the top rows are going to depict your subject genomes and their respective populations, which is right below them. And then all these numbers are those hits from those files that I just showed you. And Overall, we had about 500 query strain IDs and 200 subject genomes, yielding over 100,000 data points to further analyze. And this is the box plot that Dr. Mustafa generated from the master sheet that I had just showed you. And the X axis represents the population. And within each lineage, there, there's the telomere adjacent sequences and also random samples which served as a control to eliminate any bias in our study. And the y-axis represents the number of strains that contain the query sequence. So the blue and green dots are gonna demonstrate hits that are lineage specific, as noted down here. And that means that they're unique to that lineage, while the um, red and orange dots demonstrate um, hits that are non-lineage specific. So in other terms, that means that the sequences are shared by strains among different lineages. And then you have your hits down here at the bottom underneath those populations and the total numbers at the top. And the box plot ultimately demonstrates that along with telomere junctions, telomere adjacent sequences showed poor conservation among host plants as well. And you can specifically see that in population arise. You can see the abundance of dots, especially blue dots down here at the bottom, showing that only a few number of strains have these sequences. And um, all in all, only 39% of this host plant showed lineage specificity. So in conclusion, we determined that contrary to form of belief in regards to telomeres and their ability prote to protect the genome from degradation, this study suggests that chromosome tips are a region of enhanced genome innovation. Chromosome ends are not fully protected against sequence degradation by telomeres and the paradigm has been challenged. We can see this and the variability of sequences among the telomere junctions and the telomere adjacent sequences. If the telomeres were stable and not subject to degradation, we would see the same sequence in each strain and we would not see strain specific sequences. Now you might be wondering what the big picture of this study really is. Um, this study implies that spontaneous telomere failure could provide adaptive benefits for the fungus Magnaportha as this is indicative of enhanced genome innovations. And our study is unique because many other pathogens are host specific while this pathogen has the ability to jump to multiple hosts. And um, like my colleague Jane had mentioned earlier, in 2016, the destructive pathogen jumped to wheat in Bangladesh, a country in South Asia. And in 2017 and 2018, it struck in Zambia, which is a country in East Africa. And not only is Magnaportha one of the most economically devastating crop diseases throughout the world, but the broad host range puts many plants at risks. And such destructive crop loss can lead to massive famine, um, certain disruption of certain social structures among societies, and this could even lead to a potential war. So for our acknowledgements, we would like to thank Dr. Farman for giving us this opportunity to work on the research project. And we'd also like to thank Dr. Um, Mostafa for helping us through everything. And we'd also like to thank Dr. Kelly for being our advisor and advising us through this process. Thank you guys. And thanks for taking the time to listen to us. Thank you all three. Are there any questions for Jane or Haley or Murray? <clears throat> You can just call out folks or go and raise your hand or put something in the chat 
the chat at the chat room. So do you expect this to be something that would be useful eventually in remediating this particular fungal disease in these crops? Sorry about the microwave going off in the background. Uh, is this something, is that the end goal is to try and get somewhere near where you can uh, deal with this fungal pathogen in crop, crop plants? That would be ideal. Um, a lot of the, our results right now are up for speculation, um, but um, for instance, where we saw the avirulence gene, um, AVR PIDA, that one maps all over the genome and specifically we see it in subtelomeric regions. Um, if we were able to find other genes that are maybe associated with um, the telomere or motor relics, um, those we might want to avoid um, in future cultivars of certain plant species, um, just because the, the fungus may be able to sort of out evolve that cultivar then. And Jane, if, if I could add to your um, answer, Marsha, uh, what is emerging with, with these studies, um, and these guys have kind of uncovered this, is that this is going to be a very difficult plant pathogen to control. Um, it overwhelms us with its adaptability. These genomes are, are <clears throat> these different strains, it's like having, you know, 100 different people, humans, and each one has a different genome, which would just totally freak us out. So we're now realizing that abilities to control these <clears throat> fungi in terms of particular <clears throat> um, practices, shall we say, its ability to host jump and its ability also to evolve resistance to various plant defenses so rapidly, it's a much bigger threat than we ever realized, quite frankly. Um, so it's kind of like, you know, the, the coronavirus now, by the way, as you all know, is evolving some rather rapid <clears throat> mutations and um, <clears throat> alterations, and it kind of mirrors the Magna Porta situation. We're now just realizing that the coronavirus is a genius at rapid evolution. Um, and so I think, Marcia, we're realizing it's going to be, this is, this, this is a much bigger problem than we ever realized as far as containing contain an actual pathogen, because the genome is so able to generate such rapid adaptations <clears throat> to um, host environments. Well, they've known that um, bacteria really are not all the same. That's kind of been something that... Uh, mm -hmm they've been looking at for some time and they find that, you know, you have strep pyogenes here, strep pyogenes there, but they're not yeah. the same. And so there's definitely, you know, populations evolving constantly. So it yeah. does make sense that this fungus has evolution going on under, sorry about the microwave, keeps going off right when I'm talking. You're fine, Marcia. Yeah, and especially the fungus is found all over the world. And like like we've said earlier, in 50 different species. And the one in wheat specifically, like that one was very, very recently arose. And um, from some of the papers I read, um, they're thinking that it came from these more weedy grass species surrounding wheat fields. And this opportunity arose where there were just some wheat strains that didn't have the certain resistance gene. And once um, those weedy species then lost, um, no, they had that, I'm getting things mixed up. Essentially, um, they were able to jump into this, this other host plant. And it's so widespread and found in so many different species that um, there's just a lot of opportunities for it to continue to evolve and, and sort of um, find new opportunities for itself. If I could ask Haley and Murray a question uh, based upon undergraduate research, it's a very strong focus of our department. Uh, Murray and Haley, um, what was the most fun about this effort or has been the most fun so far and what's been the most challenging um, or difficult part of the effort? Um, I would say the most fun is definitely the team building experience and working with these colleagues because they are so great and it's so comforting to realize that like 
something that Marie or Jane might struggle with, like I've struggled with too. So we can bounce ideas off of each other all the time. And that also does go hand in hand with the difficulties is because it's so hard not to get bogged down in um, something you're doing if you're doing it wrong, because these command line scripts can be so intensive that it's definitely intimidating, but you always realize like there are people to reach out to and there's always someone to help you. And then I also think one of the best parts of undergrad research is like once you have gone through the process of everything and you finally get the results and you're finally able to understand like why it's doing this and like what's occurring and like understanding mm -hmm. the process of everything. Yeah, it's definitely fascinating and I wouldn't want to be on any other team, that's for sure. You're very kind, Haley. I appreciate that. Um, for everyone else, let me um, also point out the value to me. <clears throat> this summer, uh, Haley and Murray were involved in a training experience with Dr. Farman, which he funded through his grant. And at one point, we were doing a Zoom, and Mark was coaching uh, Haley through some commands, and they were just flying. I had no idea what they were doing. Murray was setting up these astounding uh, Excel sheets. And again, I just sat there, you know like a dumbass that I am and let, that, let, let her and Mark just take off. So what I found as, as a faculty person is that you can get students who have amazing skill sets and can really take me a lot further than I could go. So it's been a great <clears throat> mutual learning experience in that the students, Jane, uh, Murray and Haley have brought to the team effort skills that I don't have. And they've been able to build those skills with Dr. Mustafa and Dr. Farman to again, asked some really, really great questions. And I, I, I harken back to how many times Mark would say, I had no idea that was going on. Um, Ray would find something, Haley and Mark would say, I had no idea this is going on with our genomes. Mark's been in the system for over 25 years now. And these undergrads and our grad student, Jane, are now making discoveries that, you know, we had, again, we had no idea. So it, it's been a, a fantastic experience for me as a faculty mentor to basically give the students freedom and say, guys, just try it. I know, I, I don't know what's going on, but you guys figured it out for me then. So um, it's been fantastic. <laughs> Other comments or questions for our, our presenters today, folks? Okay, hearing none, I think we will stop at this point. I thank Jane, um, Murray and Haley, it's not recording. Uh,